Hi, I'm Bruce Hood and I'm a professor of developmental psychology at the University of Bristol in England and I'm here at the Royal Institution to talk about the science of happiness and this is covered in my new book The Science of Happiness, Seven Lessons for Living Well. Lesson number one, alter your ego, refers to the fact that we tend to experience our life from the first person perspective. In other words, we're very egocentric. And this is fine when you're a child because literally you are the center of attention. But unless you can become more allocentric or other focused, then there's a real danger you just become almost narcissistic. This sort of person just seeing yourself always at the center. The reason that's a problem is because we tend to blow things out of proportion. So in order to become a happier person, we have to get our problems into perspective and recruit the support of others around us. Hence, we have to form these connections with other people, which is really the basis for the second lesson, which is avoid isolation. You see, as a human species, we evolved to be very cooperative. In fact, we need each other. It'd be very difficult to survive without the support of others around us. And so we have these very large brains which enable us to perform all these really complicated social computations. But big brains actually require a lot of effort to raise, and that's why our childhoods are so long. Now, if we are requiring others to look after us, then we have all these emotional connections of attachment and love and so on. And the worst thing you can do to anyone is to isolate them, which is why ostracism or being deliberately excluded is so painful for us. At the other end of the spectrum of life, the other reason we need to be connected is that loneliness is so detrimental, not only to our mental health, but also our physical health. Did you know that loneliness has a bigger morbidity risk than say moderate smoking or obesity or some sort of drinking problems? Lesson number three, reject negative comparisons. Now this is really difficult because one of the fundamental operations of the brain is to always draw comparisons. This is how we detect any event, any experience by sort of always drawing a comparison or a contrast with what went before. So food tastes saltier if you've just eaten something sweet, or room can seem hotter if you just come in from the cold. So every state of the mind is a comparison. Now when it comes to happiness, that's problematic. Because if you're considering yourself in terms of how well you're getting on in life and how happy you should be, if you're drawing the wrong comparisons with others who seem to have much more glamorous lives, then you're gonna feel inadequate. And that's one of the reasons that social media amplifies this sort of compare and despair problem. Lesson number four, become more optimistic. Now that's easier said than done because frankly, we pay more attention to all the negative things in the world because it's just more impactful. And the reason we do this is because from an evolutionary point of view, it's much better strategically to look out for anything which might remove you from the gene pool. And that's why we focus on negative information. But you can become more optimistic if you put in the effort to do so. And in the book, I explain how you can go about doing that. Lesson number five, control your attention. Now, you may not believe this, but half of the waking day, our minds are wandering. Now that might sound like, you know, pleasant daydreaming, but actually a lot of the time we're thinking about everything which is going wrong in our lives. And this is called rumination. This is also associated with a network in the brain called the default mode network, which sounds like it could be fun, but often you're thinking about everything that could be going wrong in your life and all the things which might happen in the future. So how do you stop that? Well, surprisingly, if you free your mind up with meditation, actually that attenuates or slows down the activation of the default mode network. Lesson six, connect with others. Well, this goes back to what I was saying in lesson two. We are a social animal and we forget how important it is to stay connected, especially in this busy world. If you look around the world and the commuters and you look at people in transport, nobody's talking to each other. They're looking at their phones because this technology is so seductive, it captures your attention. And in fact, people think it would be awkward speaking to strangers, but studies show if you force people to strike up a conversation, it turns out to be much more enjoyable than they would have predicted. So why not connect with others? It will make you a happier person. Finally, lesson number seven, get out of your own head. It's a terrible place to exist in, okay? Because it's full of criticism, self-doubt, and you're blowing everything out of proportion. So how do you do that? 
Well, in the book, I document some of the very controversial new research on the use of psychedelic assisted therapy, which turns out to be very promising in the treatment of intractable depression. But if that's not for you, and I'm not recommending everyone should try it, then there are other ways in which you can induce altered states of mind which are really conducive to well-being. So trance states, for example, are, are states where you're losing that sense of self, where you're becoming attenuated, are really great as well. Or try and seek out some experience of awe. For example, uh, if you are ever lucky enough to go into space, one of the most common reports from astronauts is that looking back on Earth, they have this immense or intense emotional experience, a, a feeling of connection with humanity. This is called the overview effect. Or find moments of solitude in nature, go for a walk in nature. That also can induce these very positive states. Finally, there are no simple fixes. There's no easy path to becoming a happier person. In fact, you need to be unhappy a lot of the time in order to appreciate when things are going well. But what we can do is change how quickly we respond to negative setbacks, which we all face. And in doing so, we can become more resilient.